I got a lot of positive feedback on the first installment of Whistling Past the Graveyard, in which I took an existential look at a movie about a killer doll. Don Mancini called it great on Twitter, so that's my screensaver now. A basic tenet of good horror is if people like the first one, you should deliver five or six sequels, right? Hell yes, you should. And I know, you're like, wait, are you really gonna spend a whole video on every Chucky movie? Even part three? And I'm like, why you gotta be a hater? And also, yes, yes I am. There really is something to be said about each of these movies, and a larger point to be made about the series as a whole that I'll get to in time. But as for Child's Play 2 in particular, we're going to get into what makes a good first sequel. Beginning with giving your audience more of what they liked about the first one, without shamelessly pandering to them. You definitely do not want to do that. <laughs> After the release of Child's Play, rights owner United Artists decided they wanted to be a little more family friendly, and they sold the series to Universal Studios. Universal saw their shot at a Jason Freddy sized franchise and immediately commissioned a sequel. And I have to give them credit, they chose the best possible elements to carry over from the first movie. Sure, Tom Holland didn't come back, but he's never done a sequel, so I suspect that was never on the table. And Katherine Hicks was also out, but I'll get into why that was probably a good idea in a bit. What they did bring back was Don Mancini on the screenplay, and that was smart, because his ever-increasing involvement in the series is to its benefit. Alex Vincent? Hey, wanna hear me say your name backwards? Kyle. Also back and still adorable, check. But of course what everyone really wanted was more Chucky. Lots more Chucky. With Kevin Yeager pulling the strings again and Brad Dorf doing the voice work, Chucky is front and center from the get-go this time. That's something common in horror sequels. See, in first installments, the monster is teased out because for most people there's nothing scarier than what they don't know or understand. But by the end of the movie, exceptions notwithstanding, the monster has been fully revealed and the metaphorical genie is out of the bottle. Note. Sometimes the literal genie is out of the bottle. The point is, once it's out, it's very difficult or impossible to put it back. So instead, sequels tend to lean into letting the monster run amok in new and interesting environments. Like New York. Or space. Why is it always space? So the very first thing we see is Chucky's charred and decapitated corpse being restored by Play Pals, the company that makes the good guy doll. They're basically OCP meets Mattel. They're the sort of soulless corporation we saw a lot of in movies at the time, and they're eager to show their shareholders that their product doesn't randomly murder babysitters. Of course, they have no idea reconstructing Chucky will give him new life and once again send him on a quest to get his soul into Andy Barclay's body. And that brings us to the other thing a good sequel typically does, which is feel like a natural progression of the first movie's story. Movies like Halloween 2, Friday the 13th 2, and Hellraiser 2 all pick up right where their predecessors leave off, with their main characters dealing with the emotional fallout of the first movie's events. To this end, Child's Play 2 begins with Andy Barclay assuming the Laurie Strode, Kirsty Cotton, Ellen Ripley role of wiser survivor. He's now in foster care while his mother has been institutionalized. And sure, that sounds about like what would happen if you told everyone your kid's my buddy murdered a bunch of people. Ask Sarah Connor, she gets it. Sure, Katherine Hicks was a solid part of the first movie, but her current absence from Andy's life is a smart play, because it leaves the kid especially vulnerable in a strange new environment. He's now in the care of the Simpsons. Not, no, these Simpsons, these ineffectual dipshits. Look at this guy. These two are so clueless they know all about Andy's history and still leave a good guy doll lying around for him to stumble onto like a goddamn cat scare. <coughs> But that's good for Chucky, because it gives him an in, and before long he's trying to get into the boys so my lord. Thankfully for Andy the Simpsons, stop it. These Simpsons have another foster kid, Kyle, who you can tell is a rebel because she dresses in black and smokes. Kyle don't truck with no authority, man. So she becomes Andy's friend and confidant, and eventually the one person who believes his crazy talk of killer dolls once the bodies start piling up. See, Chucky is still a slasher at heart, and while he's a little better about being inconspicuous at first... Hi, I'm... Tommy! He eventually just starts murdering people with abandon, including Andy's teacher, who doubted his commitment to Sparkle Motion. He kills the Simpsons? Stop! 
He kills the Simpsons for no reason at all, and by the end of the movie he has graduated to full-on classic slasher corpse display. They all do this. Let's talk about this climax, which is my favorite of any of the Chucky movies. It's a bit of a coincidence that all this rising action comes together at the Play Palace factory by pure chance, but it's such a cool set piece it's easy to forgive. They have rows and rows of good guy dolls, and this giant good guy assembly line. It's all visually interesting, and really feels like a dangerous place where children should not be playing. I mean, someone could lose an eye. Or two. My favorite part of all of this is this one insane mechanism. There's this giant metal box where the good guys roll in and they have their little plastic limbs attached. But if you run the whole thing in reverse, the good guy goes back in and then comes back out looking like a Cronenberg nightmare. LONG LIVE THE NEW FLESH! I highly doubt such a contraption would really work like that, but oh my god I do not care. It's just so perfect for this movie, and I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it before or since. It's amidst all this impressive set design that Chucky finally gets a few uninterrupted moments in which to play hide the soul. And wouldn't you know it, it doesn't work. He's been in his doll body too long, so he's trapped there, and he is super not happy about it. Andy is now utterly expendable, so Chucky tries to murder him and Kyle all over this conveyor belt. As I mentioned earlier, the first installment of a horror series will often go whole hog with the monster in the third act, and Child's Play delivered with a nigh indestructible Chucky. He was burned and shot to pieces before finally biting it. Child's Play 2 sought to one-up that without repeating itself by having him disarmed, armed, shoved into the Cronenberg box, dipped, and exploded. It's all wildly fantastic. I would argue this is one of my favorite climaxes in slasher history. If nothing else, you have to respect that it doesn't feel cheap or half-assed. Nothing about the movie does. The budget was larger than the first movies, and it all shows on screen. In fact, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how great the film looks in general. Man do these colors pop, and is it just me, or is there a lot of red, blue, yellow, and green? It seems to be jammed with all the colors you associate with Chucky himself, which really makes it feel like his universe. Let's put a lid on all of this. The Rotten Tomatoes score for Child's Play 2 is 40%, which is ludicrous. It's not a perfect movie by any stretch, but it's a damn fine first sequel, and that's not an easy thing to accomplish. Sequels, and part twos in particular, are tricky things. Depending on how certain elements are balanced, they can either be an unmitigated success or a cataclysmic failure. Child's Play 2 walks this fine line by giving us a pleasant blend of both familiar and new, topped with a wicked awesome climax. I do feel like it does Child's Play justice, and not every Tom Holland movie is that lucky. But hey, once a franchise clears that tricky second installment, it's smooth sailing. Nobody's ever messed up a third installment. Don't fuck with the Chuck. Oh, fuck. <laughs>